get started, um, one of the things that uh, is as clear to me today as it was uh, the day it happened to me while I was in high school, there was a knock on the door at the classroom, and it was my sister's boyfriend standing at the door, not something that you would expect um, at St. Pius X High School in Ottawa. And he said, come in the hallway, I have something to tell you. And what he told me, as awkward as I felt in that same moment, was that my father had had a cardiac arrest. He was on Spark Street, he was coming out of court, uh, where he was doing some business, and at that time, in the elevator, he went into sudden cardiac arrest. He had received CPR. Uh, in those days, there was no such thing as an automated external defibrillator in the community. So the paramedics arrived, continued that CPR, and somewhere between there and the civic hospital, um, I later found out that he was resuscitated and revived. Really miraculous in its own way, and certainly something that has been indelible in my memory and something that has shaped my career, and in fact, many of my passions professionally. I was then taken to the hospital, where of course of those days, we weren't allowed anywhere near him uh, while he was being treated. And in the days and weeks to follow, uh, as a 15-year-old kid, I learned what it meant to feel helpless, to almost lose a parent. And I'm sure many of you have felt that way in, in your own lives. The vulnerability that comes with those feelings is one of the things that certainly has inspired me to uh, chart a course, if you will, in my, own, in my own profession and in my own life. In doing that, uh, we, uh, I'm the youngest of eight children. And uh, so I have six sisters and one brother. And my mother, we all were instructed to go and take a CPR course. So we all went, took a CPR course, kind of in the hopes that if it happened again, because in those days, sudden cardiac arrest was lesser known than it is today, if it happened again, hopefully one of us would be around and be able to receive that same life-saving intervention that he was lucky enough to receive on Spark Street. The challenge, though, associated with those types of feelings uh, as, a, as a young man was that you then have this vulnerability that really sticks to you. The, those Teflon years of, of adolescence uh, really were quite an awakening for me. And the challenges associated with that uh, I found was that it really set me on a path whereby I never wanted to feel that way again. So I found myself uh, leaving high school and entering Algonquin College in Ottawa, taking the paramedic program. That for me was uh, uh, one way of dealing with that same feeling of disempowerment. I could learn life-saving skills, perhaps I could get a job in this field, working as a paramedic, having the ability not only to uh, feel more in control, more um, uh, ready, no matter what happened. But also to be able to give back. Give back to a city, to a community that gave me a second chance with my own father. And for those months and years after his cardiac arrest, he had a full recovery. Uh, which is quite miraculous, really, if you think about it. But what happened to me was that I became the guy who had done, this, done the CPR program, was thinking about becoming a paramedic. So I had to walk around the block with him morning, noon, and night because those were doctor's orders. There was no such thing as an implanted pacemaker or defibrillator. It was, we're not quite sure what happened. We're not quite sure if it's going to happen again. But for a man who was six foot two and incredibly physically fit, a veteran himself, somebody that I thought a lot about yesterday, he was told to march. But he would never march more than about a few hundred meters from our house. So the circle that we lived in became his track. And for many years, he wouldn't go out for that walk unless one of us was with him. Those are life lessons that set me on a course whereby working as a paramedic then became kind of very satisfying. And not only was I able to help him, I was able to help myself and give back to the community. So I spent many years, as many paramedics have, working in an ambulance, working on a helicopter. I was a critical care flight paramedic in the north. Spent many years teaching in a classroom at Holland College in Prince Edward Island. And I was fortunate enough to come back to the Ottawa Valley. I was the deputy chief of the Ottawa Paramedic Service. And more recently, uh, last 12 years, the chief in Renfrew County. But what those years have, have taught me about what a paramedic has to offer really shouldn't start when something bad happens to someone else. When something bad happens and the tones go off or the pager goes off and the ambulance has to go rushing down the road with the paramedics in it, in many respects, it's already too late. 
Because we start measuring ourselves at that point in minutes and seconds, thinking that that's what's going to make the difference. And we know that it did for my own father. But will it make the difference for each of you in that time of need? And we started to advance in technology. Automated external defibrillators are now hanging in the hallway here in rinks throughout the county. We've placed over 240 of them throughout Renfrew County. We have paramedics working at the advanced level. They can start IVs. They can intubate. They can give you most of the drugs you'd get in the emergency department at the hospital. So we've really changed our practice environment, and we've changed our practice. But the opportunity then, uh, as I moved back to Ottawa, was to learn a little bit more, not only about cardiac arrest and resuscitation and the things that I went to school for thinking that they would make me feel more prepared for life. And I can say for 20 years, I felt very prepared uh, as a paramedic serving the community, no matter what you could throw at me. I felt very comfortable that I could give it, your, give it the best, give you the best chance of survival. And you've got fantastic paramedics here in Renfrew County that are dedicated to those very important life-saving skills. But I can also tell you that I learned an incredible amount from my mother. And I'm sure uh, most of you here have had a mother at one time in life, right? Anybody here not have a mother at one time in life? No. So you probably understand a little bit of what I'm talking about in terms of the influence that they can have over your personal, your professional life, your spiritual life. They kind of reach right inside you and teach you lessons, don't they? Well, my mother, uh, this is a picture of my mother. I did, it's not a copyrighted photo or anything to worry about. This is my mom. And my mom grew up during the war uh, in England. And she had asthma, much like our, our earlier speaker. But in those days, they used to treat asthma with smoke from the fireplace. It was smoke treatment. And in fact, cigarettes were one of the early forms of treatment for asthma. You didn't hear the wheezes because you weren't moving that much air. Right? They used to put mustard paste on her chest right, and tell her to calm down. So she had a real panic, a real anxiety related to that feeling of shortness of breath. But after my father died uh, in his 80s, so luckily we got him from his 60s to his 80s, and he died a, a very natural uh, and peaceful death, the way that I think most of us would want to, to pass on in our years. But what my mother was experiencing was not only... Uh, COPD or breathing problems uh, in advanced age. She was also legally blind with macular degeneration. Uh, she was a bit of a spitfire. I, I, you know, I can't tell a lie. She uh, was quick to share her opinion, but when she believed in something, she was full on believing in something. And I'd like to think that she gave me a little bit of that, that oomph, if you will, in life. But when we moved uh, both my mother and my father into a retirement home in Ottawa, uh, and after my father died, my mother insisted on staying in a two-room uh, apartment within that senior's home, which is a little bit uncharacteristic because really it was just a duplicate of the other room and there was no need to have two rooms. But she absolutely insisted that she have both of those rooms so that she could continue to have the ladies over for tea on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And when we pressed her on it, because it's no no cheap proposition to keep her going with two rooms in a, uh, in a large seniors uh, complex in Ottawa. But when she insisted on having that second room, she said, you wouldn't believe all of the people that live here that never have anyone that come to visit them, that don't care enough to stop by or come by and have a chat with them. So I want to have that room so that my girls, as she used to call them, would have the ability to come over and be together. Because the thought of them sitting at home alone and lonely was heartbreaking to her. So I learned many lessons from her over those years. But as I started to transition, I then started to appreciate greater, as a paramedic, what that could possibly mean in paramedicine. So we had an idea. I had an idea, and I'll give full credit to my own mother, and that are really principles and values that she shared with me. But the idea was, how can we get all 50,000 paramedics in Canada with a greater sense of awareness about the impacts of loneliness and isolation in terms of their health. It's actually a little known fact that it has a significant impact not only on your mental health, but also on your physical health. So how can we get these boots on the ground, paramedics in every community, large and small in Canada, recognizing that when they go into someone's home, perhaps after something bad has happened, 
that we don't let that person go home now until they have the necessities of life to be able to adequately care for themselves. And furthermore, how can we connect them with community and social services that allow them to remain connected in the community? So this notion that, that we call community paramedicine is something that has grown out of Renfrew County and is now, in fact, happening in eight out of 10 provinces in Canada. There are over 160 programs in the United States. We now have programs in Australia, New Zealand, in Scotland, in England, and they've taken shades of the experience that we've had here in Renfrew County. So again, we have a community of need. We have 100,000 souls in Renfrew County. Right? We have over 14 million older adults in Canada. But we also know that 30% of those older adults self-report to be socially isolated. And I want to make a point clear for you. Socially isolated and loneliness can be used interchangeably. You can be living with someone and feel socially isolated. Right? It has to do with the quality and the quantity of the relationship and how fulfilling that is for you. So just because you have people around doesn't necessarily mean that you're being satisfied in terms of your own emotional needs. So someone who has a personal support worker who comes and goes and is doing a fantastic job in their home doesn't count as someone who is working towards reducing someone's social isolation. So what we did here in Renfrew County with this idea was we used paramedics. We have fantastic paramedics here in Renfrew County. And we took that idea and we said, instead of just waiting for the phone to ring, would you be interested if we gave you a list of clients to go and knock on their door? Because we know that they live alone, we know that they may be at a risk for fall, we may know that they have chronic health disease issues that you can help coach them through. But would you take that list, go and knock on their door, and have a cup of tea with them like the ladies did with my mother? Take the time in between emergency calls to be able to do that to satisfy this need that is starkly missing in our society today. We have paramedics. We now have over 550 clients in Renfrew County who have signed up for this program so the paramedics can go in, help them perhaps with their breathing problems or their high blood pressure, but more importantly, spend the time with them to make sure that they have the contact that they need so they can express how they're feeling, so that they can actually continue to live in the manner in which they intend. So this concept where we started with a community paramedic we then worked in North Renfrew long-term care, and we took the waiting list for long-term care, and we went to their homes. And we studied that for three years. And we know working in cooperation with North Renfrew long-term care, by bringing them into the day program, making sure that they're socially connected, that we've reduced their use of the hospital, the emergency department, and 911 by over 50%. Right? We often scramble, how can we make a 1% gain in healthcare? How can we reduce wait times? How can we improve services? 50% reduction by keeping them in their own home, on their own terms, and making sure that they have the contact and the support that they need to live the life that they want. This is a huge success story from right here in Renfrew County. But not only does it apply to rural Canada, we have programs in downtown Toronto, we have programs in downtown Vancouver, Halifax is leading community paramedic programs, and this is a significant advancement. This is a friend of mine, Bill Leverett. He's one of the supervisors in British Columbia, one of the champions of this program. Their government just spent $18 million and created almost 100 full-time positions dedicated to addressing this need in the community. It hits home in a number of different ways because I'm sure many of you in the audience today have had a loved one, perhaps an older loved one, that have said, would you mind dropping by? It would be really nice to get a little bit of time with you. And I'm not here to give you a guilt trip. But at the end of the day, it actually matters to them and has a consequence to their physical health. And these are really important concepts that I, that I really am speaking in many respects on their behalf. Because these people that can't speak for themselves or perhaps they phone you and ask you to drop by or they want to have a ride so that they could go to Euchre or play bingo or do other activities actually matter in very meaningful ways. The International Federation of Aging report has outlined that this is the number one issue that's emerging facing seniors. These are significant consequences because the, both the quality and the quantity of those relationships is fundamental in terms of that person's mental and physical health. 
And when we look at that, it has a direct impact on both morbidity and mortality. It has an impact on disease and death. So what, what's typically considered a nicety, sure, and I was certainly guilty of it with my own parents. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, I'll drop by. No, I've gotten a little bit busier. You know, the cat's in the cradle kind of uh, issue that we're dealing with. You know, you put it off to next week, or, oh, it's great that your neighbor's popping by to see you. But are those really meaningful conversations? Are those the interactions that will keep you out of harm's way? We know, as a matter of fact, that social isolation increases the risk of inflammation by the same amount as not exercising. This is a very important concept because we actually measured in patients' blood those who are socially isolated and those that aren't. And there's a protein called C-reactin. And the C-reactin levels in those patients who were socially isolated with any, without any other comorbidities had the same risk of disease and dying as those with diabetes and a lack of exercise. These are important concepts that we, in society, need to embrace. And I would suggest to you, more than ever, we're actually at a crossroads in society right now that I'm not even sure we're standing and seeing the signs in front of us. As a paramedic service, we see a 7 to 9% growth in 911 calls year after year for the last 10 years. And that's not because there are more crashes on the highway, because in fact there aren't. It's not because more people are dying of cancers or of heart attacks, because there aren't. In fact, those numbers are all headed in the other direction. This is all related to the demographic shift in aging and its impact on our community and our ability to provide basic services. But as an administrator of a program, as the chief paramedic in Renfrew County, I'm not only going to look at how are we going to change that 7 to 9 percent demand for 911 services and tout that community paramedicine, which I explained to you, is going to make all the difference in the world. The reality is the crossroads represents the first time in history that Canada has had more people over the age of 65 than under the age of 15. So if we think it's a problem today, as people continue to age, it's only going to become a cataclysmic problem when there aren't young people there to be able to support them when they're feeling socially isolated. These are very, very important times in terms of our community and our ability to deal with issues of social isolation, chronic disease, and older adults. But I know Renfrew County is a very rich community in its ability to care for its neighbor and its loved ones. We know in Deep River, for example, many of the people that gave their, their life's profession uh, to the community in Deep River had children that left to go away for university. That's why we've seen significant increases in terms of waiting lists for long-term care. That's why we take care of the 32 most needy patients on that waiting list and have shown such incredible results in terms of reduction in health utilization, but more importantly, in improvements in health. This is, a, this is an image of uh, Jen, one of our paramedics in the Deep River program, and she goes uh, a couple times a week to make sure that 32 clients have what they need to stay home safely. But interestingly, she's also the person who reaches through the phone at, at those individuals' own children to remind them how important it is for them to come visit, to remind them how critical it is not only to their disease, but how long they're going to live for them to remain in contact, for them to have a meaningful, quality relationship that has frequent contacts. So my ask of you, on behalf of all of these patients that we serve, and all of the patients that I've seen in my career, who I know would benefit from a phone call, from a visit, from a hug, from an ear, is to ask you to reach out as an individual to your own family and your own loved ones, to seek out those vulnerable people in your own community and reach out to them in a meaningful way. Not only will it help their health and their mental health, I would suggest to you, it puts you in a very strong leadership position with your own children and grandchildren to understand the importance of this so that as you give to them, the next generation is there to give to you. Thank you. Great talk.